Well, I want to thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I'd like to share with you my, one of my passions is lighthouses. For the last 11 years, I've been teaching at the senior college in Augusta. Uh, are there any senior college members in here? One, two, just two, three. Well, this will give you an idea of what senior college is. There are 18 senior colleges in Maine. It's not a college, it's a fun group. It's, it's for people 50 and over. Uh, they give a new de definition to, senior, uh, to traditional colleges. Uh, it's a chance to just get out and meet other people. We have subjects like music and art and writing and culture and films and just about anything that people are looking for. Most classes run for eight weeks. Uh, I do field trips and my course this coming semester uh, starts in two weeks and it'll be 20 weeks. <clears throat> uh, we're going to go to unusual places in Maine that a person would not normally go to. <clears throat> <clears throat> and I advertised it and within four days I had 60 people sign up and my, my limit was 60 and in eight days we were at 90 and I, I said that's enough. <clears throat> there are no tests, no homework, no grades, no papers to write, just fun, getting out of the house. And we're all volunteers and the tuition is $25 a year and each course is $30 and that includes a textbook so it's about five dollars for a course <clears throat> and scholarships are available <laughs> okay let's talk about lighthouses the study of lighthouses is called ferology so tonight we'll be ferologists now there is a very famous poet and writer that was a ferologist does anybody know who it is <laughs> he and his family designed and built most of the lighthouses in Scotland. His name is Robert Louis Stevenson. Once there were 50, over 50,000 lighthouses in the, in the world. Now there are only about 1,500, and the United States has 800 of them, or thereabouts. As you can see, Michigan has the most, New York is second, and we're third. We have 68 lighthouses. Um, Ed mentioned that there might have been more. We had 72 at one time. <clears throat> Up on the St. Croix River, there was one of them. So here is a map of Maine with all the lighthouses. We go all the way from, from um, Portsmouth, or that area, all the way up to Callis. And here's one in uh, Augusta on Cavasi Lake. The study of ferology started with the Tower of Pharos. It was the very first lighthouse. This tower was 500 feet tall. And to give you an idea, the Washington Monument was 555, so it was tall. This was built in 285 BC. And back then, big was in. <clears throat> The light was produced by a, by a fire and mirrors, and it could be seen for a distance of 42 miles. It lasted for 1,500 years and finally succumbed to a lighthouse, uh, to a earthquake in 1302. Now, if you look very carefully, right here, there's a little a rectangle. Sostratus was the designer and builder of this thing and he wanted to put his name there and Ptolemy wouldn't let him do it. So what he did was one night he went out there and he put his name on, the, on that thing and then covered it up with a slight skim of cement. 
So after he and Ptolemy were long gone, the cement fell off, and there was his name. Um, the, the tower was 500 feet, 550 feet. Uh, the base here is 100 feet. Now up here in the area, now remember this is 285 BC, there was a mini mall up here. <laughs> they had a pharmacy, they had a haberdashery, and a few other types of stores like that. And people used to go up there and if you were really energetic, you, you were allowed up at the very top up here, um, just a very few at a time. Here are all the present lighthouses in Maine. The ones in green are on land, and the ones that are not are off, offshore. You can see Portland Head was, was, was built before we became a state. Wood Island also, and Burnt Island was just as we became a state. Now down here is Seguin Island. The first lighthouse on Seguin Island was in 1798, but it was just a, a wooden structure. The, the final, um, structure was built in 1857. Now, take a, taking a, a quick look here, notice that there were no lighthouses built between 1808 and 1921. Does anybody know why? The War of 1812. And also, from 1856, 1860 to 71 was the Civil War. So those are the current lighthouses. Now, if you were a mariner going up the coast, trying to find your way, how would you know where you are? All you do is, especially at night, all you do is you, you look out there and you see lights and you don't know which light you're looking at. So what they did was each lighthouse had a, what they call a signature. It would either blink or it was solid. Uh, some of the lights were white. This is Pemaquid. Uh, some of them were green. This is Portsmouth Harbor. Uh, some of them, uh, the windows are red. This happens to be Burnt Island. So that's the type. The early, before the lighthouses came, they had what they call. There you go. They had what they called day markers. This one is off Rockland. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Camden. And uh, if somebody was energetic, they would go out there at night and hang something up a light or a lantern of some type. And if they weren't, good luck. <laughs> Lighthouses come in all shapes. They come in cylindrical cans. Uh, that's that's um, Little River Light. Uh, the one on the right is Bass Harbor. It's, it's brick. Notice it has a red light in it. And then you have the spark plug, uh, that's Goose Rocks. And then they have the octagonal wooden ones, which are most, most of the ones on the um, Kennebec are octagonal wooden ones. This particular one happens to be doubling point. They have long tongs, tall skinny ones. This is Boone Island, that's 186 feet tall. And then they have short squat ones. This is um, out on Swan Island. And they have some that grow out of, the out of the center of the building. That's Egg Rock. And then we have a unique one. This is Saddleback Ledge. That is almost the full size of that island. And see that black mark there? That's caused by waves hitting 
at that point over decades. Now a man by the name of David something moved out there with his wife and they lived there eight years and ended up with six children because that's where they lived. <laughs> And these, the salaries were really high. This is annual salaries. And today it's equivalent to about 30 to 40,000, somewhere in there. Most of the lenses today are Fresnel lenses. Now that's spelled F-R-E-S-N-E-L. It's uh, after Jean Augustin Fresnel, and his idea was to put a bullseye right here. Here's the light source, and going straight out, there's a bullseye, and then he had a series of prisms so that when you looked at a light from a distance, one of these lights, it looked like a vertical line because of the the way the prisms worked, if they were in line. The Fresnel lenses come in what they call orders, which is the size. The smallest size, the smallest normal size, is the sixth order. They mark the obstructions in rivers, and they have an inside diameter of almost 12 inches and they're a foot and a half to two feet high. And back in 17, no, 1850, they cost $216, which was a lot. Then you go to the fifth order. Now, all the, lens, all the lighthouses on the Kennebec had fifth order lenses. This particular one was in Dublin Point. It's now at the Lighthouse Museum. It's 14 and 3 quarters inches in diameter, and it's two and a half feet tall, and back then it cost $354. You had to um, patch everything up. You had to be able to um, keep the light in working order, and you had to be um, very versatile. This is the four, a fourth order. It's three to four feet high and it's almost 20 inches in diameter. This particular one is at Fort Point in uh, Stockton Springs. And you can see where the prices are getting up there. We're talking $600. Then you come to the third order. This particular one is at the Lighthouse Museum. This is used for um, wide bays and large lakes. <clears throat> You can find one of these up at um, West Quaddy. West Quaddy, the, the one with the barber stripes. Uh, it has uh, the third order. It's one meter in di inside diameter, and they're four to six feet high. And it's cost $1,860 back in 1850. Then you come to the second order. Now, Portland Head had one of these. It's uh, 55 inches in diameter and 7 to 11 feet tall, and it cost $4,400. And then you come to the first order, which is the biggest, and we have one in Maine. It's on Seguin Island. It costs $6,800, and this roof is 10 feet, about. These lenses are 12 to 15 feet tall, and it's six feet in diameter on the inside. So it's huge. Now, all of these have been replaced by a little plastic job for about $250, and the efficiency of the, these lights over the other one is you lose about 2%. So it's not bad. And they're much less expensive to, to uh, power. They use a bulb about that big in them. And they only cost about $250. And they last 
uh, forever. Now here's another um, form of a Fresnel lens. They come in all form, forms. Okay, now let's talk about the lighthouses on the Kennebec. We'll start at the top. And the first one, okay, um, here is the Kennebec, right here. In 1893, over 3,000 vessels came into the Kennebec River, as well as the Kennebec and the Sagadahawk, which were ste uh, steamers that carried people from Gardner to Boston and so forth. Almost a quarter of a million people passed by this river in that particular year. And they had to be very careful. They couldn't go very far because once you get up to Augusta, the water is only eight feet deep. And that's why uh, no ships could go beyond Augusta because it gets to be two feet deep back then. So because of that, they recommended building four uh, lighthouses. So we'll start at the top up here. The first one, here's Swan's Isle, Swan Island. The first one was Ames Ledge. This was just a post out of a hundred feet out into the ocean or into the river. And uh, there's not too much known about this. Uh, it was a 15-foot post out there in the river. It's right about there, about 100 feet out. And it was, it was to guide the ships to the east side of Swan Island. It, it was just a 15-foot post, about eight inches, eight inches square, and it had on top of it, oh, here's the oil house. That's the only thing remaining now on this particular uh, site. Uh, they bought the land for $100 back in 1898, and here's a type of lantern that they had on this post. And everything was brass back then. Uh, Dexter Baker was the lighthouse keeper for this particular light. He lived between half, about halfway between this light and the next light down. And his job, for which he was paid $250 a year, was to go out every night and light this lamp uh, out they provided him with a boat, and he would go out every night uh, one hour before sunset and one hour before uh, sunrise, he would go and put it out, or one hour after sunrise, he would put it out. And he would do this at that lighthouse, or light station, and also down here. So he lived somewhere in here. Now this is Abigadasset range lights. Over here is Abigadasset Point. And a range light is designed in such a way that you have two lights behind each other, one behind the other. And you want to line up. The, the, the back one is tall, higher than the front one. And you want to be in a straight line. And the reason for that is because if you line these up, you want to make sure that you don't hit this land. So you, you want to keep those right, one above the other, and then you use this one to, to keep you from... Get, this um, Ames ledge was uh, three feet below um, water at half tide. So at low tide, it was above... So there's not, uh, there's not too much known about the Abigadasset range lights either. Um, back in 2003, the front of the fuel house was standing. Today, that's what it looks like. 
and has not been kept up. <laughs> the, these, two, <laughs> these two lights were, uh, think about this one when I get to the last slide. <laughs> um, here is, here's a post. This one also has posts. And there's one here, and then there's another one off in this direction, about 700 feet away. And we tried to find that in one of my classes, and we couldn't find it. It happened to be under a big power line, and, and the electric company probably went and uh, removed it. Was the oil house that's still standing, was that in common for both lights, you know? Yes, yes, yes. Here's the post, and you can see the foundation of the fuel house. Mm -hmm. And the post is still there. At least it was uh, three years ago. And here's the same type of lantern, except both of these were red, both at Ames Ledge and these two were red. Uh, both of these lights were abandoned in the 1930s because of the uh, lack of um, shipping on along the uh, river, uh, uh, passenger sh shipping along the river. So in 1932, they were all uh, dismantled. And again, Dexter Baker was the uh, lighthouse keeper for this particular one and the other one. Now coming down the river a little farther we come to Doubling Point and of course Doubling Point got its name because the river doubles back on itself right there. <clears throat> now one of the one of the important points about this one is right there at half tide there is a rock a very large ledge that sticks above the water at half, at half tide. So as these ships come from Bath down around, they have to make sure that they steer around that rock. In 1896, a plot of land was bought from uh, Samuel Freeman. He lived in, uh, in Arousic. And it, the lighthouse consisted of, here's the lighthouse, and back in here is, uh, there's the lighthouse again. Uh, okay, before I get to that, okay. It, it consisted of the dwelling, a small barn, and a bell tower. Uh, the lighthouse was moved. It was, it was over in here on the mainland, and... Uh, too many people were, too many ships were hitting that rock, so they decided to move it out onto a causeway here to, to help to keep the ships away from that rock. Here's the, the plastic jobby that's in that particular lens. Here's the keeper's cottage. And the bell tower was moved back in uh, 1930s and it's now here, and they used it to build a garage. They added it onto the garage. <laughs> Joyce and Jim Spencer live in the house. They bought it back in the 1970s, and they've been living there since then. And the, as you can see, uh, the, the lighthouse is in fantastic shape. Now, back in 1999, just before the new year, a fisherman was going by the light. He was coming down here at about four in the morning to go out fishing. And he went down and he went out to the ocean and fished. When he came back that night, he came up and he looked and he went by the light and the, the whole light was, the whole tower was gone. Everything but the stand. And he was so excited that he went and called the police and said, hey, somebody stole the, the, the lighthouse. And they said, what do you mean? And he said, I went by it and the whole thing is gone. So they looked into it and what happened was, Reed and Reed 
uh, came down with a crane on a, on a flatbed and a barge, and they took it away so that the people at the lighthouse could have the base uh, restructured because it was falling apart. Was there a choice of wood that they used in building some of these lighthouses? Was there a particular choice? Uh, Maple? Or? It was mostly pine. Pine. Yes, yes. In 1980, uh, okay, the, uh, the bell tower was over here first, and uh, they finally moved it away because it couldn't be heard by the ships coming down the river, so they put the bell on the, to on the tower. It used to hung out on the front there. And in 1980, uh, they didn't need it because of the, the way the ships, and the under new technology, the ships didn't need to hear the bell. So they removed the bell, and it disappeared, like most bells do. Now, uh, the bell on, Long, on Eagle Island is way up in the air, right on a cliff. And they decided to remove the bell. And the co when the Coast Guard has to do to dismantle the station, sometimes they don't want to take the stuff back to the place. So what they do is they just push it off, the, off a cliff. And some of these things are really worth a lot. Well, Eagle Island did this with the bell. The bell was huge. And it fell into the water, which was very deep. Well, one day on the equinox tide, when the, when the tide was very low, a fisherman was going by, and he saw the top of the bell. So he went over, and he got his crane, and he picked it up. And he took it, and it's, it's now uh, displayed in their town. But a lot of the um, parts of a lighthouse were uh, not treated well. They didn't want to be taken back uh, to the depository. Now, Ernie, Ernie de Rapps was out at Monhegan Island. He was the lighthouse keeper there. And one of the uh, Coast Guard people back in the 1960s, I guess it was, came and removed the lighthouse, uh, removed the bell, ah, excuse me, removed the lens. And the story was that from, from the people out there, that the, the lens had crashed as it was let out the window and down to the ground. Well, Ernie and I both found out that there's no way you could get that lens out a window to, to, to be let down. So a Coast Guardsman, we, I just happened to meet a Coast Guardsman who happened to remove that lens. And he said, no, I took it down the stairs piece by piece and took it back to South Portland. And it was stored there for two years. And then it was destroyed. But that was a second order, right? Second order, second order lens. With eight bullseyes. Eight bullseyes. All right. Now, between, as we come around the bend here, there's another, this is another range light. And right here on that point is a new bell. There was an old bell there. Um, if I can get back here to, oh, OK, I can go. Here. Um, right here is a sandbar. And now remember, um, when the ships come up the way up to Bath, these are the big battleships and uh, destroyers. They have to be very careful when they come around this bend because that uh, sandbar is quite shallow and they've been caught there several times. So they put out a bell tower there. And sometime in the mid-1900s, they removed the bell because of the new technology. 
Here again we have range lights and you can see that one behind the other it, it directs the ships coming right down through so you don't get too close to the, you want to line these two up. The keepers at doubling point, uh, the keeper at doubling point was removed in 1935 and the one at the Kennebec range light was now responsible for the one at doubling point. So he had two lights to take care of. In 1972, the bell, which was in this tower, which is now, this is a brand new tower, um, the bell was removed and it was taken to uh, New London at the uh, military academy down there. And of course in, in 1990 all of these lights uh, along the Kennebec have been automated and they're all run by uh, computer down in Portland. Okay, going, okay, here's, here's looking at the lights from the water. You can see one behind the other. And over at the left is the keeper's cottage. Now notice the little window here. The purpose of that window is when the keeper is in bed, he can look out the window down into there and make sure that light is still light, lighting. <coughs> Very carefully placed. Here's the back window. And if you go, here's the, the light, the lens as it is today. And if you go up to that window and look out, you look down the river, you can see how it would line up. And you notice that you keep them away from the right-hand side there where the sandbar is. Here's the keeper's cottage. Up until recently, this was occupied by the Coast Guard. And within the last couple of years, they've moved out. And I don't know who is in there um, now. This is managed now by the uh, Kennebec Range Light Keepers. And over here is the fuel house for it. Now the fuel houses are always kept away from the lighthouses. And the reason for that is because they, when they first built them, they put the fuel in the lighthouse, in the tower. And once in a while they exploded. So they decided we better get them away. So most of these fuel houses are at least 200 feet away from the tower itself. This is what these lighthouses look like inside. Very nicely kept up. Okay, coming down we come to Squirrel Point which is about another mile and a half down. Back in 1892 Back in 1717, mm -hmm. <laughs> the royal governor of Massachusetts came up to this point to talk to the Indians that lived on this area. It was he wanted to uh, make a treaty with them or continue con renew the con the treaty with them? And his boat was called the Squirrel, and the boat crashed on that point. So they memorialized it by calling it Squirrel Point. The only way you can get to this one other than by boat is to park up here at a parking lot and it's about a mile walk down here through the woods. Now one of the interesting things across, uh, uh, about this is right across the river here in Phippsburg is the Universalist Church and in there right in front of it is the oldest tree in Maine. It was planted in 
uh, about two years before the American Constitution was written, which was 1790-something. Okay, back to Squirrel Point. <laughs> Um, it wasn't too much later that the lighthouse keeper for the other two w became responsible for this one too. So this, the keeper was responsible for all three of them. And if it got foggy, the keeper would have to come down here and park and walk this mile, which was not the easiest, and start the foghorn. Here's a picture of the, uh, the site itself. Way over here on the right is the fuel house. Here's the lighthouse, and here's the barn. And over here at the right is the boathouse. <clears throat> this little platform here, during the uh, 50s and 60s, 1950s and 60s, the Coast Guard used to go out there and have parties on the weekends and they would invite their gals and they'd go out and they use that as a dance floor. That is now gone. <clears throat> Back in uh, 1993, a man by the name of Mike Trenholm uh, formed an organization and under the main lights program they were sold this site for a dollar. And under the Main Lights program, you could buy a place like this or lease a place like this for one dollar, but you had to keep it up and you had to make it available to the public. Well, Mike um, Trenholm uh, spent quite a bit of time fixing up the building and he became ill and was no longer able to do anything, so he tried to sell the place. And the first sale uh, advertised at $500,000 and um, it was not well approved of and so he reduced it to $375, $375. Now remember he only paid a dollar for this and what happened was the neighbors and the cities, uh, citizens of the neighboring towns uh, put up such a stink with the Coast Guard that the Coast Guard came and re- captured it and took it away from him. So there's the church across the river. You can't see that. I suppose that tree right there. It's a linden tree. And here's the, the lighthouse itself. It has been since painted. Notice it's not a red uh, lamp. It's, they, they put red plastic around on the inside of the glass. And here's the boathouse. Notice something unique about that. <clears throat> okay, coming further down the river, we come to Perkins Island. In 1892, 93, 94, and 95, they petitioned Congress to give them money to build a lighthouse. And it wasn't until 1898 that they finally got one. And it cost $17,000. The lighthouse itself, the tower, is in good uh, was has always been in good repair because the Coast Guard's taken it over. You can see the the keeper's cottage was in tough shape. Uh, in 2000, it was uh, painted and and they they've been working on it ever since. The American Lighthouse Foundation is now uh, improving it, and they're always looking for volunteers to come out and help. The bell tower was in horrible shape. Um, this uh, was rebuilt in um, just before 2000. And again, notice the, the distance between here and the tower. The tower is way over here somewhere. 
the fuel hose. Here you can see right at the edge is the fuel house. I can point out this is this island is part of the Main Island Trail as well. So if you're a Main Island Trail Association member, you can camp on the island. It's pretty bushy. Poison ivy too. <laughs> Speaking of poison ivy, uh, I took my class out to uh, the Abigadasset range lights uh, back in 2009 and I told them now, we got there at 9 o'clock in the morning and I said, you may find some mosquitoes, you may find some poison ivy, and so be careful. Well, I forgot to mention that there were ticks out there. And several of them got, uh, ended up with some ticks on them. But we were all eaten, but we had a good time. Uh, in 1979, the lens was replaced with a plastic jobby. And the fog bell was uh, removed. And the bell itself is now uh, in the front of the Georgetown School. It's kind of in a, it's almost covered up. Uh, and they replaced the bell with a horn. And this horn would go, and it was very loud, and it would last for thir three seconds every 60 seconds. And it aimed across that Parker head. <laughs> And when it was foggy, you can imagine it would go for hours, three seconds every 60 seconds. And the neighbors and so forth uh, sued. And so they, they made a smaller, uh, replaced it with a smaller horn. How are these uh, old lighthouse keepers' houses? Are they utilized in any way? Because you mentioned they're refurbished, and or are they just sort of like uh, uh, monuments? They will be open for tours. Uh, if you go out as an individual, they, I don't think they'll give you a tour. But when I bring 30, 40, or 50 people out, they're glad to, because I always say that we always donate $5 a piece to these places, and they're always glad to have a group come and they give you a complete tour of the whole place. And sometimes we get into the towers. But um, just, just for tours. OK, uh, now we come down to Fort Popham. Fort Popham has a cute little thing. It's about that tall. And it's green. There it is. <laughs> The first one was out on a post uh, down by the, by the river, and the ships couldn't see it. So they, they moved it, and they put it up closer to the, uh, to the fort, and it was higher, but it still wasn't high enough. So now it's up on top of the uh, thing. In 1940s, it was, it was put up on top of the uh, fort. That's about as close, as close as you can get to it. And there it is, uh, right at the point. Now, somebody was asking about uh, uh, going out to Seguin Island. Uh, when I take my classes out there, uh, we, there is a dock right here on the back. And we always take off from there, and we go out to uh, Seguin Island. It's about two and a half miles out. Okay, now we'll go to Pond Island. Back in the, 18, in the War of 1812, soldiers were, were stationed here to keep the British from going up the river. And uh, they succeeded in that. <coughs> In 1821, the first lighthouse was built. This is Pond Island. They have no idea how it was, there's no pond there. They have no idea why it was called Pond Island. Uh, back in 1849, a ship was coming from 
Spain to um, Portland, Boston, and it passed by this lighthouse and it crashed on the rocks. And all 24 people were, were killed, but the dog survived. The dog was able to jump off and, and, and swim ashore, and it was right near this uh, lighthouse. Now, back in the early 1800s, this was a stopping off point for travelers or, uh, uh, yeah, travelers going from Portland or Boston to Bangor. And if you wanted to go to uh, Augusta or Bath or something, you would dr be dropped off here on this island. But you can see that it is very difficult to get onto this island. Now you can imagine back in the 1820s with the women with the big bustles in the back, uh, getting off a of ship and jumping onto that island and uh, waiting for the next ship and then they would have to jump back on. Now you remember the lighthouse, uh, the, the tower that I showed you that had the, the wave waters up there? The only way you could get onto that island, that rock, was with what they called a bosun's, bosun's, chair. bosun's chair. It was a post going up and an arm going out. And you would climb into this chair and it would swing out like that and then they'd let you down into, the, into a ship. And it was not the most comfortable way of getting on and off. Here's what the lighthouse looks like today and it's solar powered and it's automated. And here it is at a distance and in the background is Seguin Island which is about two miles away from from here. Okay, now we'll go to Seguin Island. This is the last one. And it's two and a half miles out from the land. And here it is from a distance. And if you want an eagle eyes view, Here is the, uh, they, they had a bell up here, way back, and you can see how far it is from the, from the ocean in all directions, and the ships couldn't hear the bell, so they, they put in what they call a, um, a trumpet, and it still wasn't loud enough. The ships still couldn't hear it, so they, so they put in there a diesel, um, powered horn and they could hear this one. The only problem was that if a seagull was got, had gotten in the front of it, it would explode the seagull because it was so powerful. This is the highest lighthouse in Maine. It's 180 feet high. The tower itself is only 50 feet high. And you can see there's a tramway that goes from the place where the boat uh, arrives and they used they used this for getting getting uh, up there to the uh, lighthouse it's no longer used for pedestrian purposes because one day the lighthouse keeper was was riding down to the to get into a boat for the to go to the mainland and she was carrying an 18 month old baby and the thing won't let go and she tossed the baby into the grass and she ended up almost getting killed. But the baby survived very nicely. A little, little worse for wear. <laughs> now if you ever go out to uh, Seguin Island, you will land here, you will be in a big boat, and the boat usually carries about 32 people. You get out of that boat into a boat that carries about six people, and you get rowed ashore and you land on the beach and you have to jump onto the beach and then you walk up a quarter of a mile up uh, a path which is nicely mowed to the to the lighthouse uh, somebody was asking uh, can you uh, explore you can see there's trails all over the island here and I think down here is where you could camp 
there's picnic benches and a, uh, a place to put a, uh, a grill. And it's, it's quite a large island. Here's that building that uh, held the, the horn. It's now a tool shed. Here's the lighthouse. There's the lens. Now that's 12 feet tall. It weighs 15,000 pounds. This is the lens. Now, the Ernie, did you ever, you didn't put that lens together? No, I never was there. Okay. Uh, these lenses are made, were made in France, and they were made by individuals uh, in a company. And they were shipped to the United States. Each piece is a, uh, is a prism. And each piece was wrapped in a felt-lined leather pouch. So it would be in a shape like that. Each piece. And the lighthouse keeper, who happened to be there at the time, had a book about this thick, and he had to put it together. <laughs> now, this particular one had 700 and some odd pieces in it. It took him several months to build to put this thing together, <clears throat> and it weighed 15,000 pounds. Here's a closer, closer view of it. Now, back in the, eight, in the 19, oh, 85, the, the Coast Guard decided they were going to eliminate this light and replace it with that little plastic jobby there. And the local group, which was the Friends of Seguin Island, said, you can't do that. Uh, actually, the Coast Guard came out there, and they were getting ready to do it. And the people, uh, the organization said, you can't do that. It has to be approved by an act of Congress. And they didn't believe him, uh, the people. And they said, all right, we'll go back and check. And sure enough, they were right. So they came up with an alternate solution. They said, OK, we'll leave the lens there, but we'll put this little plastic jobby there. And they said, no, 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 no. We want the light. Well, there's a 17,000 foot cable that goes to the mainland. And the bulb in here is 1,000 watts, and it goes all the time. So that's, that's a lot of power. And they said, well, we'll save money by doing this. And this little thing is only a 20 watt bulb, and it can be seen just as well. Well, they went and got a petition, and they got the, the two senators involved, and the Coast Guard was talked out of it. And so it still exists. Uh, there are some ghost stories about Seguin Island. Uh, one of the white keeper's wives wanted to learn to play the piano. So her husband went to the mainland and got a piano and brought it up that, that tramway and, and brought it into the house with several people. And she, she only knew one, ple one piece, and she played it over and over and over. And it drove him crazy, and he ended up taking an axe to the piano, to his wife, and to himself. And they say, if you ever go out there, you can now uh, go out there and stay overnight. And they say that the doors open and close by themselves once in a while, and you can hear that piece that she was playing. <laughs> but does the Fresnel light still work? Do they yes, use it? yes, yes. It's it's on all the time, and uh, uh, let me see. <laughs> if you look over in that direction, uh, it at night. Uh, the, one, the last time we were out there, we saw Mount Washington, which was 90 miles away. What, what's the uh, lamps in the Fresnel uh, like? This particular one is a 1,000 watt bulb. It's about the size of a tennis ball can. Is it like a tungsten or? It's just a plain projection lamp. Yeah, it costs like five, six dollars. Uh, they have 
I think I have a picture. Yes, there are two lights in each one and these lights go for three months and then they're replaced. And if one of the lights goes out during this three month period, it automatically switches to the other one. So that's the, they're about the size of a tennis ball can, a thousand watt bulb. Now the ones today are, you know, little, little itty bit things. So do you have a sense of the cost for what the power, power bill is to run that? Uh, no. Oh, well, a thousand watts for, for 365 days, 28 hours a day. That's a lot of money. <laughs> uh, we were, I, t I take a class out there every year. And one of the times that we were out there, the, uh, they have keepers out there that are, uh, they advertise to see who would like to become a keeper there for the summer. You're paid $75 a, a month or a week. $75 either a week or a month. And um, you, you get to take care of the place, mow the lawn, uh, keep the place clean, and accept and give tours uh, up into the tower and of the whole place. Well, one day, the, the keeper there was telling us that uh, he called Portland. See, this, these are all controlled by computer out of Portland. And he called the uh, Portland people and said, hey, the light's out. Mm -hmm. And the man looked at his computer. He said, no, it isn't. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm looking at it. I'm standing where I can touch the bulb. And they're both out. And he said, oh. <laughs> so that shows you how good computers are these days. <laughs> this summer's keeper uh, was, was one of a couple that had come up from Florida. And she was born in the house in the late 1950s or early 1960s oh. when her father was a Coast Guardsman. Oh, very good. Returned to be here this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a program where they advertise for lighthouse keepers for the summer. It goes from Memorial Day to Columbus Day. And uh, the first time they did it, they advertised it, they had about 20 um, volunteers or applicants. And they had to choose a couple. And they did. The following year, they had about 500 uh, applicants. And each year, it gets bigger and bigger. Now, they have to interview each one of these people and decide who they're going to choose. So it's, it's an interesting thing. <laughs> Did they? You're going to be there this coming year? Okay, I will see you in, uh, in June and in August. <laughs> and you notice, oh, I'll, okay, I'll get to that. How are, how are your axe handling skills? Yeah. <laughs> Do you play the piano? <laughs> I'm not allergic to poison ivy either, which is good, but you can learn a lot that you know. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. All right, here's, here's the lens again. This is my favorite lighthouse in Maine. And here's, again, looking up into it. Now, when I take my class out here, I always take an 8 by 10 picture and give it to the keepers. And so you will receive this, a picture like that. Um, the first time we went out there was in 2003. I took my class, and we, as we walked up the, the quarter mile track, just as we got to the top, it started raining buckets. And I ran over here and took that picture. And it lasted about five minutes. And I was able to see, see the, uh, the little T here. There's a uh, clothesline there. And if you go over to there and look due east, you'll see a flag. And right out there is Spain. <laughs> well, those are the lighthouses on the Kennebec.